Hello, I'm Stephen Cole and welcome to The Answers Project, the podcast where we look to find the answers to, or at least try and make sense of, some of the trickiest questions facing us in this increasingly complicated world. We've got access to some of the best brains on the planet to see if they can help shed light on some of the most pressing ethical, scientific, geopolitical and, well, let's say, philosophical quandaries. And every week I'm joined by Mari Beveridge to help me unravel this week's question. So, let's uh, crack on. Mari, what have you got for us this week? Today, Stephen, we are asking whether or not soldiers will become obsolete. Great question. Uh, and very relevant today. Uh, I guess there are two ways of looking at this. The optimistic one, we all get along with our neighbours so well, there's no need to have armies anymore. Or, I think probably more likely, what I think you're probably getting at, with technology developing at such a phenomenal rate, robotics and AI, artificial intelligence, are going to do away with boots on the ground. Soldiers, as we've always known them. Is that right? Let's be honest, the first option doesn't look likely in the near future, but the second is really worth a second thought. Could robotics, AI and all the incredible technology out there replace soldiers or even save lives? Have you ever heard of Slaughterbots? No. Uh, uh, Slaughterbots, Mary. And now I'm not a, a, a teenage gamer. Well, neither am I, but I have heard of Slaughterbots. And um, this is the stuff of science fiction. This is soldiers effectively being replaced by robots. And it's a topic that lots of people are concerned about. If intelligent robots take over the role of soldiers in the future, and they're increasingly driven by powerful AI, will man or machine be in charge? And more importantly, who should be in charge? So I'm going to show you a video now I've seen recently that absolutely terrified me. It's had over 40 million views, this. Um, just two seconds whilst I pull it up. So what we're looking at is a robot the size and shape of a man. He has a metal torso and powerful limbs, and he's on a training exercise somewhere in the desert. It looks like America to me. And the robot's hands are able to hold a variety of different guns and weapons, as you can see here. Um, and he can shoot and hit targets. And look how accurate he is. Um, it's, it's, it's quite chilling how accurate he is. And he's being beaten by his human handlers. Um, and every time they beat him, he just gets up and moves on to the next target. Oh, wow. That, I mean, the first pictures I saw of this just now, this is the first time I have seen this, uh, I thought it's a film set uh, or it's, it's some kind of a, a demonstration for Star Wars or something. And these are um, generated pictures. They're, they're not actually happening. But I can see it is, and I bet the members of the crew had an absolute ball sort of knocking over the or trying to knock over the robot. Um, this, this has been the fear. This is science fiction, as you said earlier. Does it exist? Will it happen? I'm going to stop you there, Stephen. This video is, in fact, fake. It's been made to look like a PR film for a robotics company, which shows the world just how sophisticated robots and automated weapons have become. It's really not far off what technology is capable of. Robots which can pick up things, uh, use sensors to react to movement by shooting. And what you saw in that video is what people are afraid of. Slaughterbots, robots that can go out and kill on command. And the question is, who is going to be driving this? Are they going to be autonomous or are they going to be manned? Well, the, the key, Mari, is what you said, what if. There is a lot of what ifs. This video, uh, as you say, is fake. But how close mili the military is to making something like this? I don't know. The British Army, my, my uh, son is in the British Army at a divisional headquarters. They are very, very aware of artificial intelligence. They're aware of quantum computing, the capabilities of cyber, chemical weapons, coding, robotics, defence, computer-generated vulnerabilities. They know this is the future of warfare, and they are creating uh, entire brigades to deal with this. And your first question uh, about replacing boots on the ground, I think you're right, and the future of war is basically something like you've seen on the video, especially 
about bomb disposal. Yeah, so and like mine clearing robots and unmanned aerial vehicles, which are called UAVs, and like drones. I mean, drones are technically robots. Uh, their main purpose was to be used for surveillance initially, but you know, someone figured out you can put missiles on them um, and reduce the risk to humans. I mean, just to give you a statistic, since 2004. Drones have killed nearly 3,000 people in Pakistan, uh, you know, 200 of which were children. So this is the fear is how we use these drones, which people in, in places like Libya and Yemen are absolutely terrified of. And there are a lot of sort of ethical and moral questions that are being thrown up around these kinds of unmanned devices. We're talking about unmanned systems, so I suppose that's only drones, but that's, uh, that my knowledge is limited only to drones. Yes, well, I spoke to Calvin Wong, who is the unmanned systems editor at Jane's International Defence Review, and he knows a lot about modern weaponry. This is what he had to say. We are really close to, uh, to the science fiction has been portrayed to us uh, all, all, all the years. If you look at uh, what some of the, uh, the uh, really advanced programs are uh, going on in the United States, in Europe, and elsewhere, you know, they are looking to fielding uh, a manned combat aircraft. They will be programmed to uh, protect and extend the combat power of, of a manned aircraft. You know, essentially, just robotic sort of partners that, that fly alongside and, you know, and react to uh, threats uh, when, when the apparent aircraft is, is being threatened. So, you know, we have gotten to a stage where we are literally like uh, experimenting uh, and not, not just uh, on paper, but uh, prototyping and experimenting these, these new life. So Kelvin Wong there said that more than ever, reality is catching up what we've, with what we've seen in sci-fi movies. And that's one of the reasons he got interested in the whole area of unmanned systems. But can he ever envisage a time when soldiers become obsolete altogether? Now, from my perspective, uh, the relentless march of technology will at least in some part shape the uh, conduct of warfare. Uh, although they will make, not make soldiers obsolete, but will, they will likely redefine their roles in the future. From my perspective, it's not too far-fetched to uh, foresee a future in which uh, soldiers remotely operate uh, you know, like, uh, either sing, uh, single or swarms of you know, autonomous or semi-autonomous systems to achieve mission objectives as opposed to uh, physically fielding troops and crew vehicles, uh, not in the least just to remove these uh, human beings from harm's way uh, in potentially unfavorable situation or environments. He, he's right. It, it's not too far-fetched at the moment. I mean, as he was talking, I was seeing pictures of rival groups of generals in their control rooms just firing and aiming rockets and robots at each other, which, of course, is basically what a Star Wars film uh, is all about. Now, he believes the priority of many of these innovations is saving lives. Well, I don't think so. Some of the inventions have saved lives. Uh, I talked earlier, or uh, hinted at, without really knowing what he was going to say, about the automated mine clearing devices, which can only be good news and supposedly weapons which can strike precise targets. Yeah, we've heard about weapons that can hit only the exact targets, minimising the risk for what the Americans called in the first Gulf War collateral damage. That's a euphemism for killing civilians, collateral damage. It's a polite way of putting it. But many people working in AI are worried about the really lethal autonomous weapons which do, in fact, remove the human from the battlefield. So some people actually want to see a ban on lethal autonomous weapons altogether. Uh, 4,500 AI researchers and tens of thousands of others are calling for a UN ban. The campaign to stop killer robots has been lobbying the United Nations to impose a ban. Hello, I'm Noel Sharkey and I'm chair of the International Committee from Robot Arms Control and I'm also a professor who have been working in AI robotics for about four decades now. He's the Emeritus Professor of Artificial Intelligence and Robotics at the University of Sheffield. At present, machines can't really discriminate between civilian targets and military targets. So how are they going to be able to frame a morality problem? How are they going to be able to see a situation as it arises? And how are they going to be able to be sensitive to context? Now, let me give you an example. In Iraq, some US forces, commandos, caught some insurgents in an alleyway. And they raised their guns. Under the laws of war, this was legitimate. They raised their guns to shoot them. And then they noticed they were carrying a coffin. So what they did was they took off their helmets 
bowed their heads and let them pass at some respect. Now, a machine wouldn't be able to do that because it wouldn't know what a coffin means in our human culture. Now, of course, you could program it about coffins, but the number of unanticipated circumstances in warfare are practically infinite, extremely large. You could not build a machine that could handle all those different circumstances. Machine learning is becoming increasingly sophisticated and it's used for so many different purposes now. So surely it's only a matter of time before it's used on the battlefield and could maybe save lives in the process. What you do is you put very large volumes of data into a machine and train it. And so the idea would be you would give it lots of examples of morality. Of course, you wouldn't be able to give it every example. But it turns out that people have been using this in the civilian world for some time to make decisions. They've been training machines to make decisions about mortgage, about loan applications, about jobs, about who should get bail, about judicial reviews. And now it's turned out that these are incredibly biased. They're gender biased and they're racially biased. And it seems that nobody can find a solution to this. You can't find it in large volumes of data. Now, who on earth would want to send in a machine without the sensing capabilities to tell who is who, without being able to detect context at all, and being completely biased against certain members of the human race? I don't know. So I think we should end this. There's only one moral rule that I think is applicable here. We should not delegate the decision to kill to a machine. If we can build that into all machines, I would be a very happy man. But uh, it's quite interesting with Sharkey, uh, uh, who is, as you know, is the chair of the International Committee for Robot Arms Control. Now, his group has been lobbying the UN to try and ban lethal autonomous weapons. I, I take that's right, Mari. Yeah, so since 2014, over 90 countries have met at the UN in Geneva eight different times to discuss the issue of killer robots. Um, and around 30 countries support a ban on autonomous weapons, but both the US and Russia have been blocking moves for legally binding rules on them. And some other military powers, including um, Israel, South Korea, China and the UK, are looking into developments in the area. Yeah, this all sounds extremely civilised. People sitting around a table chatting, yeah, we'll sign this arms control agreement. Yes, we're going to ban that weapon, it's not very nice. Uh, and yeah, we're, 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 we'll, we'll agree in Geneva and then we'll have dinner. And then we'll see what ISIS do. Then we'll see what the people who are taking out some Iranian scientists, uh, uh, nuclear scientists in Iran do. Will, will, they, will they sort of agree to any of this? Will do sanctions? Are they uh, a better way of, of, of going forward uh, or banning weapons? You know, the bad guys aren't going to take any notice. No, and, and another fear is, you know, what if they sort of get hacked? What if the enemy um, is turned against friendly troops? What if um, there's a remote kill switch that shuts them down in case that kind of thing happens? There's, like, a lot of regulations that I think we, we have a very small window to start looking at. And these sorts of international negotiations take a lot of time, um, especially when different parties might be t talking about slightly different things. So you need to define autonomous weapons. Even Antonio Guterres, who is the Secretary General of the United Nations, has called these weapons politically unacceptable and morally repugnant. And um, in May this year, he called for a prohibition on lethal autonomous weapon systems. He said it's his deep conviction that machines with the power and discretion to take lives without human involvement must be prohibited by law, by yep. international law. There's, there's uh, a lot of momentum, uh, as you say, for a ban, but with the current climate and with huge divisions in the UN, which isn't always uh, obeyed, uh, and a lot of people don't really follow a UN guidelines, I, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. D doesn't history show that countries are always going to be uh, the ones trying to be the first to invent the most sophisticated weaponry in order to win wars? Whoever d invented the airplane in the First World War was going to win. Yeah, so there's always been an arms race for as long as people have fought wars. Um, I've actually found a historian who specialises in this. Joanna Bork is Professor of History at Birkbeck, University of London, and the prize-winning author of An Intimate History of War and Wounding the World, How Military Violence and War Play Invade Our Lives. She says people have been worried about weaponry and technology distancing humans from the reality of war um, since the American Civil War in the 19th century. 
And so in the past, we've seen other um, RMAs, as they call them, revolution in military affairs, the invention of gunpowder, of aerial warfare, etc. And I think what we've got now is a post-human RMA. In other words, I think that what we are seeing is a decentering of human human soldiering through technology. So we're we've got really the intro, not only the introduction but the proliferation of human machines of. Um, um, using mechanical, technological ways of, of fighting. And this is having a, a revolutionary, literally a revolutionary impact on the, the law of, of, of warfare. Um, you know, this idea of responsibility of Justin Bellow, you know, is based on this idea of an active human agent who, who is, if you like, held responsible for lethal decisions. Well, you know, that has been significantly undermined by these new technologies. Um, and also just the way people experience those acts of killing are being dramatically changed by these new technologies. Yeah, well, people have always been freaked out by machines uh, and technology replacing jobs and roles. Remember, sorry to go back to the First World War again, tanks used for the first time, these huge machines, and you're saving countless lives because men could hide behind them or uh, inside them or be covered by them, rather, not hide. Yeah, but in warfare, though, the stakes are very high, literally, life and death. What happens when a soldier can no longer see the enemy? Well, Stephen, funnily enough, that was one of my questions for Joanna Ball. The intimacy of killing has been progressively undermined by new technologies. And, you know, the American Civil War is the great example of that, where you really do get um, technology becoming a central part of warfare. And the way I was very interested in my previous work about the way men and women responded to those, um, those changes, long-distance killing as opposed to more face-to-face -face killing. So what we saw then is, you know, really, really struggling in, in, to make sense of the, um, the fact that they cannot see their enemy. And that actually was a problem for a lot of soldiers in, uh, the previous, in previous conflicts. What we've got now with this long-distance killing is a, a sense of disengagement to some degree, um, disengagement with the actual enemy. Your, your enemy is as anonymous as it might be in, you know, on a computer screen, for example. But you also have this other side to it, and this is the interesting thing, I think, about 21st century warfare. On the one hand, you know, the distinction between the physical body and the avatar is blurred. In other words, the distinction between the biological and the simulated existence is sort of interchangeable. But at the same time, there is a, a different kind of intimacy um, war fighters, as they like to be called today, war fighters are experiencing. And that is the intimacy of actually following a potential enemy quite closely. So we've all heard about drone attacks on targets being controlled by military personnel thousands of miles away. Um, but I read a commentary by one of the navigators of a Predator drone, Matt J. Martin, and he talks about his four years operating U.S. military drones from Nevada and his godlike powers. He's saying sending thunderbolts into people's homes and into public spaces. And um, he also speaks about the inevitability of mistakes being made, of, of collateral damage, as you were saying earlier. And that is always going to be there. Um, you know, dead children are the byproduct of war. Yeah, horrible way of putting it, isn't it? Uh, dead children are byproduct of war. Uh, it's a fact of war, uh, a fact of attacks. So after what she said um, about the future of war, I couldn't help but ask her our big question of this podcast, which is whether or not soldiers will become obsolete. I actually don't think that we're going to see this, uh, the total eradication of the human in 21st century warfare. What we are going to be seeing, of course, and what we're 
already have seen is the um, the post-human is entering the warfare, and this entails the decentering of the human through technology, so human machines, etc. And that is going to have major impacts on the deterritorialization of warfare, of notions of what it means, what international law means, and the protections of international law. But the and of course the blurring of the, the biological body and the simulated body is definitely going to be there, but we will still have the human there making those decisions, making those choices about who is, uh, whose life is killable and whose life is worth saving. The military are very adept at finding ways, remember, of avoiding killing. Uh, the days of bloodthirsty commanders uh, leading an army in a sophisticated army are long gone. And, you know, you talk about fiction and films, war films especially, using uh, computer-generated graphics. Uh, very interesting. But the, the real films that says, show war at its worst, something like The Deer Hunter, it came very close to uh, a reality showing the stress, the post-traumatic stress, which we now call it, it wasn't called it then, uh, and uh, explaining why the U.S. lost in Vietnam, in other words, explaining how the human factor played a far bigger part than the great power levelled against you, which is quite interesting. But um, it is clear that technology is already replacing some roles in the military. But whether that means armies are reducing the number of conventional soldiers they employ and spending more money on technology is out there. Certainly governments would prefer less boots and more technology. Well, just before I get on to that, Stephen, I was going to say, um, in answer to what you were saying earlier, um, I think, you know, we're talking about the human element, this is the most humane way of taking out the bad guys. I think that in, in a lot of ways, um, war is becoming more humane. And, and if we're going to look at completely ruling out all of this sort of technology and use of technology in war, then we, we would have to also be asking ourselves whether it's OK to use any weapon systems at all. I think that this is a, a much more sort of targeted and specific way of... of taking people out, so to speak. Um, but in answer to your question about spending more on technology, according to a statistic I read in the International Institute for Strategic Studies, armies are getting smaller relative to the civilian population. But in absolute terms, they've stayed at a fairly constant level over the last two decades. And I suppose if you're then moving on to military spending... Uh, which is what it's all about, really, because governments are cutting budget. While well, some governments are cutting budgets, others are spending more on their navies and air forces. I'm guessing the biggest spenders have to be the US and China. It's a very good guess, Stephen. What I didn't know was just how much more the US spends on defence than everywhere else. According to the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, um, in, in 2019, the U.S. spent 732 billion U.S. dollars on defense, which is more than 10 countries combined. Those countries are China, India, Russia, Saudi Arabia, France, Germany, U.K., Japan, South Korea, and Brazil, which amounts to 726 billion U.S. dollars. So it's still not meeting the U.S.'s uh, budget. And, of course, the U.S. is the world leader in technological developments in the military. Let's not forget, defence is business. It's big business. <laughs> it's a lot of money. Uh, Great Britain makes a huge amount of money selling weapons to uh, Saudi Arabia and other countries. But what we haven't touched on is the part, or the roles, perhaps, soldiers do a regimental sergeant major. You would never re replace a regimental sergeant major with a robot. <laughs> uh, but peacekeeping, building trust, intelligence, I suppose there must be roles, or roles that never will be replaced by technology. Yeah, so I was interested to hear actually what soldiers themselves think. Um, of course, they're hardly likely to talk themselves out of a job. Uh, Beth and Canterbury served in the British Army for 28 years, and she was the first female commanding officer in Afghanistan in logistics support. She's currently chief of staff for a disaster response charity called REACT. But she, she said to me when I spoke to her earlier this week that you can't replace a multidimensional being with AI. It is a very nuanced way a soldier will behave. So one minute they might be on a war fighting patrol to hunt out specific known insurgents, and then next day they may be body armour off, helmets off, patrolling in a safe area to meet with the local elders, in the, you know, have a sure in the village to establish peaceful links and to build support in the local area. So that whole 
hearts and minds piece has been such a key role for the certainly for the UK military for a long time and I I don't know how you build that kind of trust with a human community if you're not doing that with another human being that can look them in the eye and and instinctively have that feel for what is appropriate if you want a just a war fighting force then maybe they could do it in time and develop it that's not our sole role it's much much more developed than that and essentially a nation should be trying to prevent warfare and you do that by the subtlety of these sort of hearts and minds and these and these roles could technology ever replace boots on the ground I think, you know, we've seen the good and bad side reported of emotions that obviously run high, especially from people who have been exposed to the traumatic reality of a battlefield. But but there's another side to it. There's a side where you have uh, an experienced, you know, body of people who have been in that kind of environment before who instinctively know what's not right so it's not about being able to analyze the information in front of you and make a judgment call on yes we'll fight it's about having the intelligence and the sixth sense if you like to recognize what's not right in the situation are you being led into an ambush you know are the children no longer playing on the street you know what have you been told by the local farmer i don't know how you program in a sixth sense and a subtlety and a and a still moving ahead on the objective even if logic and statistical information is telling you that you shouldn't that you won't win you know the the human spirit is a magnificent thing and we always say yes soldiers fight for queen and country but they they also fight for their mates they fight for the person to the left and right of them the values and the culture and what it stands for is still up in terms of personality as well. And I, I'm not sure that gets replaced. And again, for all the subtlety of the, the different roles that we ask of our soldiers, I still think there is a, absolutely a place for that. And I, I don't think we're at the point where AI has developed enough to replace all of the nuanced roles that soldiers deliver. The idea that our future militaries are all AI and robots is quite scary to me. It's quite Black Mirror. Yeah, well, that's the thing. You you get taken to the last film you saw where it was just hordes of robots and you just, you know, that's what I mean. I, uh, human nature takes you to that vision of it and I'm sure it's much more subtle now, but um, yes. <laughs> I don't think we're there yet. <laughs> no, no, I would agree with that. So, I, I think you both agreed, came to agreement at the end of that, sort of, well, absolutely right, uh, technology will never, uh, you should never say never, should you, uh, be able to replace the roles that soldiers have done in the past and continue to do today. Terminator movies are exciting. Well, they were, the first half dozen, I suppose, <laughs> but <laughs> we're not quite there yet. Robots could be used to do the jobs that soldiers don't want to do. And there are plenty of jobs soldiers don't want to do, the ordinary uh, uh, grunge anyway. Or that put them at greater risk, perhaps, you know, even saving lives in the long run. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge issue and it's a question that can't be answered, which is why I suppose we're doing it on this podcast. And um, Some of the people in AI I spoke to are really, really worried that we have international protections about chemical, biological and nuclear weapons, uh, but not lethal autonomous weapons. Um, so I think, you know, look out for an eventual international ban on lethal autonomous weapons and the tools that are available like drones, robots and uh, automated guns they can be created pretty easily and the danger is that they won't be easily controlled. Key word, Mari, thank you so much, Mari Beveridge, um, putting all that information together. E even if we didn't answer the question with a simple yes or no, we thought about some of the issues that it's turned up and we're hoping you, uh, our audience, will get in touch if you've got a burning question you'd like answered or at least perhaps unraveled by the agenda team. Do leave us a message on our Twitter or Facebook pages or by email at theagenda at cgtn.com. And you never know, it might just be featured on a future edition of Ask the Agenda. Remember, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher or Spotify and also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube. 
Just look for at CGTN Europe. And thanks for listening. Goodbye. Goodbye.